As the interest in Anglo-Saxon history seems to grow exponentially with each passing year, it comes as no surprise that many English and those of English descent choose to identify with their Germanic forebears and their great heroes. Many of us now revere Alfred once more as the only English king truly deserving to be called the Great, an epithet naming him as the best, and many in the Anglo-Saxonist community will point to Æthelstan as a great victor and Bede as the true father of historical research. However, particular fascination is focused on the old religious practices of the Anglo-Saxons, the pre-Christian ones of which we know very little. Many Anglo-Saxonists are atheists or self-described pagans, and thus look on the pre-Christian Anglo-Saxons with some kind of fond nostalgia. Of all the pagans, the one we have the clearest historical picture of is the great Mercian king Penda. Indeed, not until the days of Offa, his kinsman, would his deeds in uniting the English be surpassed. The question, however, is, was this man an evil, cruel sinner, as the Christians, including Bede, claim? Or is he a martyr for a revived Saxon faith who fought against Christian tyranny? As we'll soon see, the answer is based heavily on the framing. First, we'll run through King Penda's life. Penda was born around 606 AD, perhaps to a mixed British-Saxon family, but this claim is hotly contested. Penda and the name of his father, Pibba, seem to be Britonic to some people, but others have pointed to Germanic origins. I myself am not going to make a claim on that front. Though Penda accrued Welsh allies, it must be remembered that ethnicity, as today, is rarely a reason for military alliance. It is also very likely that they simply just had common enemies. For whatever reason, many believe revolt due to a dynastic dispute with the former king. It is believed that Penda became king in the 620s, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle claiming 626, where he presumably he succeeded the former king Carl. Bede, however, instead claims that he took the throne at 633 AD, after he defeated the Northumbrian Edwin. This version paints an interesting picture of a classic Germanic hero, Penda as a powerful adventurer, playing a leading role with his own band of men, but such an interpretation is unlikely. Penda may have been a freelance fighter or a lesser noble seeking fame and increased wealth and power. For sure, however, is that his lifestyle then would have matched the Norse pagan tradition most admirably. Bede's account of Penda gives a much more compelling argument for how King Penda was such a master of warfare, having plied the trade before becoming king. But even his pre-kingship deeds can be called amazing for the tactical prowess he must have shown against superior forces. Whatever his position, whether a low-level landowner, warrior, or king, Penda's great victory at Hatfield Chase is indisputable. Teaming up with Cadwallon of Gwynedd, the strongest king of the Welsh, he won a decisive victory over the Christian king of Northumbria, Edwin, who was unquestionably the most powerful English king of the time. Cadwallon took Northumbria for a short time until his death in another battle against Northumbrians, the last Briton to reconquer territory for his people, and Penda was likely rewarded handsomely for his role. Notably, however, the cause of this battle was not religious. Edwin was a recent convert to Christianity. His enemy, the Welsh, were all Christian. Edwin's men were likely a mix of Christians and pagans, and the Mercians were most likely majority pagan. This was a battle brought on by Edwin, now Edwin the Martyr, expanding his realm to rule over Britons in the West, Britons who were already Christianized. In 642, Penda fought another Christian saint, Oswald of Northumbria, again with Welsh allies, but this time it seems as the defender against Oswald. Penda and the Welsh overwhelmingly won the battle. Another Christian king was martyred simply because he died in battle against a pagan, and Penda was now the strongest ruler in all of England. Good for his Welsh allies, who wanted simply to hold on to what they had, but a terror for all of now Christian England. That is to say, the rulers were Christian, the people probably were a mixture of different faiths, but Christianity did win out rather quickly. Though Penda appears to not have waged war on religious terms, based on the system of the time, Christian kings likely had to pay him tribute, not for their faith, as in like a jizya, but to avoid their lands being plundered or taken. It is possible, though unverified, that Mercian pagans resisted Christianization because their king fought so well. To a warrior culture, this would be a sign that the old gods were pleased with their sacrifices and festivals, and the Christian faith was misguided. We must remember, however, that nothing of the life of Christ nor the existence of their god would have deterred pagans from worshipping him. The syncretic faith of the Anglo-Saxons likely allowed them the same freedom that Romans had to worship whatever spirits they so chose, but to also honor the gods of their people. 
Thus, like the Roman state religion, which believed in Jupiter and Saturn, but also allowed the worship of beings such as Isis and Mithra, Anglo-Saxon faith most likely would have been fine with Christ, if not for a few problems. In fact, some place names, such as Luton in Bedfordshire, contain old Celtic names that imply Celtic paganism had perhaps left some impact on the Anglo-Saxons. That is, Luton being the town of Lu, the Irish and Welsh sun god. It was the exclusive nature, however, of Christianity, which held up only one god as true, and conflicting views on the afterlife that made them incompatible. Though we cannot say for certain what the Anglo-Saxons' belief of the afterlife was, Certain leftovers from the pagan past do seem to appear in some poems that indicate perhaps that there was a world tree. Oftentimes, Earth is referred to poetically as Middle Earth, which could mean between heaven and hell, but could also refer to a old pagan belief in it being Midgard, so to speak, to borrow a Norse term. Thus, the Anglo-Saxons may very well have believed in the idea of Valhalla, as their Norse and presumably North Germanic counterparts also believed. After a 22 to 30 year reign over Mercia, constantly raiding into the north, it seems Penda met his end in 655 at the Battle of the Winwad. Sources contradict each other, with Bede, the constant enemy of Penda in his writing, claiming that Penda wanted to destroy the Bernicians, that being people in Northumbria, uh, in Bernicia, a specific smaller kingdom at this point, despite being offered much wealth from the king, while the Welsh, Penda's allies, claim that the sum was paid to Penda and distributed amongst the army. Who is correct then? As much as I enjoy Bede, I have to side with the Welsh here, as they are not pushing a narrative. We know clearly that much of what Bede says in the ecclesiastical history is Christian propaganda, at least when he's talking about pagans, and he sympathized heavily with the Christian English, the Christian Welsh considerably less. It appears that King Oswiu paid Penda ransom and then attacked Penda when he least expected it, while he was in a strategically and tactically disadvantaged situation. Another point towards the Welsh Chronicle being correct is that the Welsh, in an incredibly unflattering account of one of their own leaders, claim King Fenwadu fled the battle as the fighting turned against Penda, and the last great non-Christian king in England was eventually slain. With Penda's death and the conversion of his son to Christianity still within Penda's lifetime, paganism had lost its champion, and all of Mercia was soon converted, at least marginally, to Christianity. So what do we make of Bede's claims of Penda's savagery? Unfortunately, the historical record is unclear. We know Bede thought of him as a barbarous pagan, but as we've also seen, the Christians he fought were oftentimes equal warmongers, attacking their neighbors at any opportunity. Of the heathen rituals he practiced, we know too little to comment. The Anglo-Saxons may have been similar to Vikings in many ways, but no evidence shows us human sacrifice or any other such barbaric actions. Penda, it is true, raided heavily into the north of England, killing many innocents and burning villages, but this is no way dissimilar to his Christian contemporaries. Indeed, it seems that all of the actions his foes had in common with him were righteous when they did them, but diabolical when he performed them. Modern historians have done much to rehabilitate the reputation created by England's greatest historian. Many now see Penda as the beginning of the end for Northumbrian dominance and the beginning of the Mercian supremacy. From his reign on to the Viking invasions, Mercia would be the foremost power in England, and his dynasty continued to be influential for centuries to come. Penda is the end of the Pagan Age, but the beginning of the Mercian and perhaps the English Age, as he wielded such power as to be overlord like Offa, King of the Angles, his eventual successor. Penda, much like Offa, was able to bend all of England to his will at times, beating East Anglians, Wessexians, and of course Northumbrians time and time again. In fact, one could perhaps say Penda was greater than Offa in that he was able to subjugate Northumbria, something that Offa never truly achieved. Much like Offa, however, Penda's goal seems to have been mostly to help himself and his family, not to create some greater English state. As for Penda's brutality towards Christians, it is also exaggerated, if it existed at all. Penda seems to not have complained about his son Peda converting, and his allies tended to be Welsh Christians, who had a Christian tradition far older than any of his rivals. 
Many of Penda's enemies would be fellow pagans or recent converts. This again points to a religious view incomprehensible to many followers of Abrahamic religion. Penda simply went with what worked. He had probably always given offerings to Woden and the other gods, and since this brought him victory up until his death, it never occurred to him to change gods. His gods seem to have proven their existence by giving him victory after victory. Does this make Penda a martyr for some Anglo-Saxon paganism? Maybe some Vikings who were knowledgeable enough to know of him might have thought so, but it's simply not the case. Again, we're not talking about an organized religion where orthodoxy was important. We're speaking of folk beliefs that were based off of custom and procedure. Penda did not identify as pagan or heathen. Either of these terms were meant to denigrate people like him, label them as backwards or rustic. He would have simply considered himself a man who believed in certain gods, gods who wanted sacrifice and in return could be called upon for aid in battle. He believed that just as important as his Welsh allies, the gods would be his allies as well. It is likely Penda died happily, seeing as he died the heroic death expected of one of the Germanic faith. If the Anglo-Saxons were all like the Norse, it is likely he expected a Valhalla to go to, and continue his beloved trade of warfare on a larger scale. It is important for neo-pagans not to idolize Penda, just as it is not correct to demonize him. He was simply a product of his time, a pagan warlord who carried the same Anglo-Saxon values as his Christian foes. Like them, he believed in honor by the sword, in kingship earned in war, and in expanding his territory as much as possible. He was hardly a man of books and learning. He was likely illiterate given his potential disregard of the church, though unlike many contemporaries, he likely had a respect and knowledge for the Britons and their culture, the depth of which would have been unmatched among other rulers. We can conclude that if he was more barbaric than his Christian foes, it was only because he was the first Mercian to play the game of war on so large a field.